Walter, thank you very much for honouring us with your presentation today and addressing a very broad topic on everybody's mind, or many people's mind anyway, and that is, will a new international order emerge after this pandemic, maybe dominated by dictators, uh, Islamist revolutionaries uh, and others, uh, or not? Uh, is the US in retreat, in decline, or not? Uh, so tell us, Walter, who will lead the post-pandemic world? And uh, we'll be following your words very eagerly. And, the, and as Joel said, there'll be opportunity for follow-up Q&A. Walter, the screen is yours. Thank you. All right, well, thanks. It's great to, uh, to be, be here even virtually. And uh, my office is now as hard to get to as Australia because we're all completely locked down here in Washington. But it's, uh, it's good every now and then to talk to somebody who doesn't live with you or isn't in your apartment building. So hi to all these new faces. It's great. Um, who will lead the, the world after the pandemic? Well, obviously, Australia and New Zealand are opposed. You both, both countries have had uh, a terrific um, a response to the pandemic. I suppose you're fighting with New Zealand, as usual, over bragging rights for who was the who was the most effective? But certainly people here wish that we had been able to have as much success as you've had in Australia at limiting the damage and, and the deaths. But more seriously, we are much too early into this process to really be able to talk confidently about what happens after it's over. Um, we're only about 90 days in from the first death in the United States. And already the pandemic here has killed more Americans than the entire Vietnam War. It's closed more businesses and thrown more people out of work than the Great Depression. And it's disrupted international travel and trade on a scale that no one has seen since World War II. Um, so this is big. And it's still hitting. That is, we don't know yet uh, uh, if, this, if we're going to see repeated surges of this virus, will there be another outbreak in the fall? Of course, 1918, to, uh, the second wave was, was deadlier than the first. Uh, what will happen as more countries begin to try to ease out of their lockdowns and, and go in back to normal? Will the, will the disease resurface? Does that mean we'll be facing, instead of a short, sharp recession, a long spiky recession with, with uh, lots of, of attempted recoveries that are, that are curbed by the virus? Or will we find treatments and vaccines relatively quickly? Um, we don't know how the, how the virus is going to play out. It's, it's only now really beginning to make its mark in much of the global south and the so-called developing world. A uh, country like Nigeria has been hit uh, by the, the crash in oil prices, by the loss of remittance income, um, uh, the capital flight back to the first world, uh, collapsed market for any industrial exporting that Nigeria tries to do. And of course, in other countries like Thailand, there's no tourism. So around the world, we are seeing the, you know, the sort of uh, the consequences of this pandemic. And it's likely they're going to work out differently in each country, given its own situation and uh, the responsiveness of its public health uh, system, the state of its finances, and many other factors. So we, we've got, we're at the beginning of a long and complicated and probably mostly unpleasant process of sifting through the rubble and trying to find out just what's, what's going on. Um, and maybe as people start trying to process the, the lessons of this thing, the first thing to remember is that this pandemic is teaching us that while human beings have lots of delusions of grandeur and love to feel that we are in control of our fate and that we banish nature and so on and so on, this little virus is reminding us that there's a lot that goes on in the world that we don't understand and we don't control. And we are in a Human, this human civilization that had thought of itself as our only dangers come from within. We could start wars, we could cause climate change, 
but we weren't worried that something from outside our technology, outside our industrial economic development would sort of come along and knock us down uh, like bowling pins in, in the bowling alley. But that's exactly what has happened. That psychological change uh, will change the, um, the way I think, uh, particularly young people living through this, think about the place of human beings in this world, think about where history is going, uh, how this will work out culturally, it's hard to say, but this is gonna be a factor everywhere. It's going to reduce our confidence in expertise. It's gonna reduce our confidence that the people in charge know what's best. We've kind of watched, we've all watched scientists, economists, politicians, try to wrestle with this thing. And it's clear that the infor we had so little information at the beginning and information has, is still coming in and we're having to make decision after decision in the absence of the kind of knowledge and expertise that you would really ideally like to have. And so our expert classes have, have uh, been caught short a little bit. And I think that will have an impact globally. Let's start with the U.S. when we think about how, what, what may be happening uh, as a result of this pandemic. And the, the question obviously everyone is asking uh, in the United States as well as outside of it is, what will the effect of the pandemic be on the 2020 election and the chances that Donald Trump will gain another four years in the, in the White House? And at one level, it looks like essentially very little has changed. Donald Trump was, about, was behind Joe Biden in the polls before the pandemic hit. He's behind Joe Biden by about the same amount now. In the interval, his poll numbers went up a bit, but they have also come back down a bit. So, so far, the net effect of the pandemic on the polling of the, behind the presidential race has been close to zero. Um, and that is, on the one hand, people are saying, well, gee, that's, that's pretty bad that Trump couldn't get a bigger uh, political boost. You know, uh, it should be a rally around the flag effect here. But on the other hand, it's also interesting that with the biggest economic collapse since World War II, the presidential presence and, and decisions that haven't always looked inspired or inspiring on TV, um, uh, hideous death toll. With all of this, the president's poll ratings have really not gone significantly down. So that reinforces this idea that what we're looking at in 2020 is a contest between a president who has a high floor, but maybe a low ceiling, and an opposition party that needs not only to get a greater number of popular votes, Hillary Clinton got more popular votes, than Donald Trump, but needs to carry certain battleground states uh, where the Electoral College gives uh, Trump a chance to actually gain a major regain a second term in the White House, even as he loses the popular, popular vote. So it's going to depend, at this point, it still depends on the electoral campaign. And, this far away from the election, it's still essentially too close to call. And what do we see there? I think we see that there, the, the Trump campaign has two strategies that it needs to use to try to get to victory. Uh, one of them is to attack Joe Biden, uh, to try to make uh, Joe Biden seem unlikable, untrustworthy. Biden does have some weaknesses. He's personally very popular. But we saw over the impeachment that some of the business dealings of his son, Hunter, uh, often look controversial and not all voters approve of them. Um, we are now having a, uh, a bit of a scandal. Uh, did, but he's, been, he's been accused by a former staffer of sexual harassment. Uh, for some time, the media wasn't taking this issue seriously, this, this woman seriously but there now seems to be enough corroborating evidence of some kind 
that that it's it it's going to be in the newspapers. It's going to be on television, and as yet we don't know whether that will hurt him. Now, you might say, how is this? How could this hurt Joe Biden? One allegation when he's running against Donald Trump, who has you know strings of allegations and you know a sort of a you know has a reputation and has been thought, you know, has got non-disclosure agreements with porn stars or who knows what, you know, how can Joe Biden be faulted? And the answer is not that people look at Joe Biden's alleged wrongdoing and say, oh my goodness, that's as bad as what Trump has done. It's more they say, look at the hypocrisy. Look at how the Democrats are always talking about, oh, we are, you know, we're the party of treating women right. And Biden himself has called, has argued that all women should be believed when there are allegations of this kind. If that standard were to be applied to him now, he'd be in trouble. So you can make him look like a hypocrite. Uh, and so you have this set of issues that he can work, uh, he can try to chip away at Biden's popularity much the way he did with Hillary Clinton in 2016. Beyond that, China, uh, the, the sort of issue that the Trump campaign is likely to, to try to focus people's attention on is China. Trump is a populist. Trump needs to run against the establishment. He doesn't run well as a president who's responsible for what the government is or isn't doing. He's, he is the tribune of the people mobilizing the outsiders against the privileged insiders against an, an untrustworthy establishment. The China issue, besides helping to deflect any criticism about the coronavirus response, the China issue is a sort of is, is an excellent case for establishment stupidity. That is, for 30 years, the foreign policy establishment has been telling uh, you know, the, the rest of the people, look, free trade with China is going to make China democratic and it's going to make America rich, Americans rich. And at this point, there are a lot of people in the United States who would say, wait a minute, it hasn't made me rich. And by the way, it doesn't look that democratic either. It's emerging as this, you know, communist threat. Uh, and all the, and China has gotten rich as a result of this free trade. And it's a result of all of these establishment ideas. And it's now going to be using its power to threaten and challenge the United States. So this allows Trump, as who has, you know, while his record on China is not crystal clear, he does have a long record of being much more critical of China than the, the bipartisan foreign policy establishment. So it gives Trump a real chance to shine as the defender of the people against a stale consensus. And also it suggests the nation is in danger. We need a strong leader. We need tough policies. So I think that's, I think we can expect a combination of a, of a very, very negative campaign from both sides with uh, Biden trying to, uh, with uh, Trump trying to push on, uh, on China. In terms of American leadership around the world, obviously you have one sort of picture if Biden is elected and another if Trump is reelected. I can't tell you how that's going to work out. And I think at this point, we should maybe not spend too much time speculating about those alternative futures. But let's turn to another country, which certainly has emerged as a kind of um, uh, uh, world leader in waiting, you might say, and that, and that would be China. Um, you know, how is China doing out of the epi the pandemic? And has China succeeded in sort of using the high profile gifts of medical supplies and so on? Has it been able to, to, to create good feeling and a sense of confidence and trust in China? I think, you know, at this point, the answer really is no. Um, uh, Xi Jinping has not been having a very successful run as leader of the Communist Party of China. You have the, the problems in Hong Kong, 
You have the revelations about the problems in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. Um, you have all of the sort of internal dissension over the pandemic and what was clearly a very, very poor early response by China, both internally in terms of managing the, the outbreak and externally in terms of telling the simple truth about what was happening in ways that really have left people all over the world in many different countries feeling that while it may not be China's fault that the virus um, emerged, viruses emerge in lots of places, it is China's fault that the virus was first allowed to spread. It's the fault of corrupt local officials in Wuhan, perhaps uh, a clumsy national response. And then certainly China withholding information from the world in critical weeks um, uh, was a very, very serious um, abuse of trust. So I, I think we're, we're, we have actually seen so far that the, the pandemic has, globally speaking, reduced confidence in China. I think there are going to be some more issues along the way that, that may ex exacerbate that. One will be the question of debt relief for debt held by China at least uh, in, by developing countries, debt of developing countries. So far, it looks as if the pa Paris Club, World Bank, IMF, are set to offer more favorable terms on debt relief than China on some of its uh, bilateral aid. Don't know how that's going to work out in future, but um, uh, China does not seem to be ready to take a very, very large hit to its uh, debt portfolio. And this has something to do with the fact that a lot of the debt is held by Chinese companies who are feeling some pressure for other, other reasons. But the whole BRI expansion is now looking uh, both as if it was a little over ambitious if, if we're gonna see slowing growth and also has left some very, very complicated debt-fueled relationships. But I'd say even more than this, um, when we look at China's situation right now, I, I think we see, we see all the signs of a government that is far more worried about internal security than it is about external security. No one in the world is trying to conquer China, partition China, or threaten China in any way but the government remains dramatically insecure. Um, and this has everything to do with the state of internal opinion and very little to do with, this, with anything that's going on outside. And it, the reasons for this uh, sense of, of tension and worry, and I won't go into them in detail, but I think it is worth noting that the, the, the problem of slowing growth in China is structural. A small economy can grow much faster than the rest of the world very easily. The larger an economy becomes, the harder it is to grow faster than the world average. In a way, it's, it's like a very small mutual fund can have an easier time beating the market than an enormous uh, fund with lots of, lots of capital. But it's also that you can't grow that much faster than your customers forever. We also have a problem that uh, the global sourcing of manufacturing, which worked for China at times, is now beginning to work against it, in the sense that you can now make things more cheaply outside China. Um, you, automation is reducing the employment of people in China, even as manufacturing goes forward there. There's also a systematic overinvestment in China, massive overinvestment in infrastructure predicated on a kind of economic expansion that is, is, is not happening. Um, the, the managers of the system don't really know very much about how to manage massive financial crises, if only because China has not really gone through a true test of its financial system and of it of the capacity of its managers to, 
to, to do that smoothly. And it's likely that the Chinese financial system with uh, all kinds of sort of shadowy corners and poorly understood relationships among different types of institutions will ha will contains a lot of surprises. And a lot of these surprises will blow up in the face of regulators and others should a real um, economic downturn uh, uh, take place in China. If we add to that the stress that the pandemic is placing both on the Chinese economy domestically and also on China's customers globally, it's a mess. It's a mess. Uh, the Chinese, I, I'm certainly not going to say that they're incapable of resolving these problems. There's some very, very competent people in Beijing and they think long and, and hard about these things. But it is, we should not underestimate the challenge that they currently face. Uh, one other thing I think we should just note in passing is that if we look at the history of communist regimes, and increasingly it's clear that we need to, you know, the Chinese Communist Party is a communist party. It intends to operate like a communist party and it has a communist party's determination to hold, stay in power at whatever human cost is necessary. That it sees holding power, the holding power in the hands of the party as an objective that transcends any other. Um, and what we've seen in, in parties of this type in the past is when the leadership makes mistakes or when the country gets into trouble, you have more repression. You have more centralization of authority. No doubt can be permitted. Stalin and, and Mao acted in this way when they were in trouble, they doubled down. Castro has done the same sorts of things in, in uh, Cuba. Uh, so we may well see uh, waves of repression in China if these other problems continue to, to get worse. Given all of this, I think China will be playing uh, defense internationally, that, that it, um, uh, with the economy in trouble, with, um, without a lot of running room for Chinese authorities, with a public opinion that they need to sort of constantly distract and cater to, China is likely to continue pushing a very nationalist narrative in its engagements. If you think about these so-called wolf diplomats or wolf warriors that the Chinese have been employing um, at one point against the Wall Street Journal and against me, um, this, this sort of very, very aggressive attacking diplomacy uh, has not really, you know, everywhere it's been tried, it has turned people away from China. It has reduced the degree that China is held in trust. It's reduced confidence in China. It's a very ugly, it's, the Europeans are angry about it. In Australia, it hasn't gone over well. It's, it's, it's very much backfired in the United States and other countries. Um, so why would you do something that is frankly so stupid? Uh, it does seem to me that one reason is that they are more concerned about internal opinion than external opinion. That China's energies are focused on maintaining control and stability at home rather than at sort of making some great leap forward to international leadership. So I'm not sure that China at this point is, in a sense, ready for or looking to take on leadership. Russia, uh, uh, well, I, you know, I think Vladimir Putin has clearly not had a good crisis. And uh, an oil price, when the, when the oil price turns negative, that's, that's not good for Mother Russia. Uh, the EU is, uh, you know, is again internally preoccupied. So you have one way of thinking about what's coming out of the pandemic is a bit of what. Uh, my friend Ian Bremer talks about with his Eurasia group, he talks about G0, where a world where nobody is in charge. Now, I think that's a little extreme. I think the United States uh, uh, will emerge from this still with a unique world position. But it's going to be, 
we will clearly in the US have to focus a lot of our efforts uh, on our own health and on our own economy. But those who think that the United States has sort of abandoned um, leadership in this crisis, in my mind, uh, they seem to be more sort of, it seems to be more an expression of bitterness at Donald Trump uh, for all kinds of quite understandable reasons than a, a serious argument. Because if you look, for example, what the Federal Reserve has done in terms of keeping preventing the world economic uh, system from seizing up where the you know availability of dollars around the world plays a, a massive role in, in financial crisis. And the United States has really been there in an extraordinary way. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF are moving much faster than in any previous crisis to extend debt relief to the developing world on far more generous terms than we've ever seen. So I think that, and, and if we look at the economic stimulus that the uh, Congress is passing, again, we see just uh, a tremendous determination to get the economy back on its feet. And for all the temptations for gridlock in Washington, people are acting and, and acting quite, you know, in a quite strong and coherent, and even at times a bipartisan way. So. Um, I think we're going to see a difficult world, a complicated world, but I think when the, uh, when the storm clouds pass, what we will see is something not that different in terms of the structure of international politics than what we saw before, which is that the United States is a kind of, you know, reluctant and somewhat unsatisfactory hegemon but will continue to play more or less this unique global role that has played for a very long time. Thank you, Walter, for that. Uh, that was fantastic. Greatly appreciate it. Now we'll move on to our question and answers. So again, I'll give you a brief tutorial as to how this works. Down the bottom of your page, you will see a little icon that says participants. If you click on that, you will see a list of the participants that are on the Zoom call, and you'll see down the bottom where it says raise hand ah, there we go so people are using it now um, so place your hands up raise raise your hand uh, and then i'll be able to call upon you just wait one second for then ariel to switch on your microphone you'll be freely then you'll see yourself on the screen you'll be able to ask Walt the question and then we'll go from there i'm going to hand off the first question to federal member of parliament andrew wallace thanks very much um what uh what um what point do you see or what, what are the likelihood of a conflict arising uh, as a result of, um, in relation to Taiwan with the US and China? Uh, uh, Walter? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, if China thought that it had a real option to, to conquer Taiwan, uh, that could come very, you know, the, the crisis could come very quickly. But it, you know, from what I can see, that the balance of forces at the moment uh, still really does not make that a very good bet. And a, you know, for a, a Chinese government to try to take Taiwan and fail would be a humiliation so great that it would be like the Argentine generals and the Falklands Malvinas. It would be a be worse. It'd be a total unimaginable disgrace. So I, can, I, I would think that that prospect keeps a certain caution there. Um, but it is, uh, it's something that everyone has to take careful, uh, think about quite carefully. Uh, one, one must always keep looking at the balance of forces. I'm glad to see that the US Navy has stepped up its activity in the region a bit. It's, uh, you know, China is not happy with the fact that Taiwan is seen to have had a, a better crisis than, than Beijing has had. That is, that is not good news for Xi Jinping. If I can just have a follow-up there, Joel. Um, sure. what, 
do you do you see the continuing South China Sea tensions uh, uh, continuing to evolve and and, and to um, uh, increase in their magnitude? This is again, this is an answer only China can answer that question, because uh, given the importance of the South China Sea to Japan, something like ninety percent of Japan's trade moves through the South China Sea. Um, uh, and given the importance of the principle of freedom of navigation to sort of America's national sort of global strategy, uh, there's really, there's, there's absolutely no way that the, uh, let's, you know, the, the sort of uh, the associated powers or whatever we want to call uh, this group, the allies, can accept uh, uh, Chinese sovereignty over the South China Sea. It's unacceptable. So the question then is how hard does China try to make it, make it so? And that ultimately does risk pushing toward violent encounters between Chinese and other forces. So far, uh, China does not seem to, to think that doing this in a direct way is advantageous. And as long as that's the case, then I think there's a, there's a cap on, on what we might expect from day to day. But it is a dangerous situation and it's not getting better. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Walter. I'll now pass on to uh, our editor of the Australia Israel Review, Dr. Spieth Fleischer. Uh, thank you very much, Walter. That's a wonderful presentation. Um, as you may be aware, uh, Australia has just had some sort of not so veiled um, economic threats coming from our Chinese ambassador here uh, because we asked for an a world inquiry, a WHO inquiry into the origins of the virus. Um, in the aftermath of this, assuming US leadership continues, is there anything um, the world or the US led world can do to sort of uh, reduce the ability of China to try and throw its economic weight around? Uh, to bully countries or, or to try and use as a, a major source of influence? Well, look, um, I think what we're going to be seeing, uh, and we're already starting to see, is countries rethinking the way they do business with China. Um, you know, you've seen the reports that Japan is offering to underwrite the costs of Japanese companies who want to reduce their dependence on China-based supply lines, uh, supply chains. I think we're going to see uh, a lot. You know, what, you know, we're going to see a lot of countries saying we need to make sure if there's ever anything like this again, we can make antibiotics, we can make masks, etc. So we're going to see a certain kind of delinkage from China in those ways. Um, I think there will be other companies who see a kind of a a reputational risk of too close an association. Um, others are going to say, you know, it's just, it's just it's too political. Um, you know, there could be a trade war and, and everything I produce in China has all of these tariffs, or there could be um, anti-foreign mobs in China. They're just, they're just better places to put your money and your investments. And I don't think this is going to be a, a sort of wholesale uh, withdrawal of foreign capital from China. And there are a lot of companies that are very deeply engaged with China and aren't likely going to turn around. But I think what we'll see is, a, is that people will think more about investing in, other, in places other than China. So as that happens, I think China you know, rather than feeling that it's in a position to bully and threaten the rest of the world, is going to actually feel some pressure itself. And we'll need to think a little harder about, you know, how do I attract investment? There's a great, um, I don't know if you guys know the uh, American musical Annie Oakley, but there's a great song in there, You Can't Get a Man with a Gun. Uh, you know, you, you can't... Uh, you, you can't get an investment with a wolf diplomat. Uh, 
And to the degree that China wants these close rela economic relationships with other countries, it has to rethink the path that it's on. So I, you know, yes, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, yes, you know, I can, I expect some bullying and so on from China. But again, when people who've been bullied by China tend to say there are two things that happen to you. One is if you give in, you know, hoping for peace, you get peace then, but you're on the list of people who can be bullied. And so there will be more bullying in your future. But people who stand up to them, and this is what I think a lot of people around the world see in Australia, people who simply refuse to be intimidated and, you know, and simply stick to their own position and don't do it in a, you know, provocative, crazy manner, but simply in a realistic, business-like, purposeful way, stick, stick to their positions. China perceives the bullying is not very useful as a tactic and, and moves on. Thank you, Walter. I'll now, uh, we'll keep the questions brief because we've got a few people to come and hopefully we can fit it in within the 60 minutes. So I'll hand over to former photojournalist at SBS, Marcus Rubenstein. We're uh, rolling. Uh, Walter, thank you very much for your time. It's been an illuminating discussion. You may know I'm the editor of a website called APAC News and I, I wrote a, uh, a very long editorial, which got picked up, no doubt, by the Chinese uh, attacking your story, China is the real sick man of Asia. Well, not attacking your story. I was quizzed many times. Uh, it, was a, it was a very good, very balanced, very well written opinion piece. I thought the headline uh, was unnecessarily inflammatory, and I thought that was far more a reflection on Murdoch media than you. So I just want to give a little bit of my perspective on this thing. I think from Australia-China perspective, I think this is a gross failure of diplomacy on both sides. Uh, look, I don't want to, you know, single people out, but I think from uh, a government perspective, there's an obsession on the strategic relationship with China, where there's an economic relationship. I think Japan is probably a good example of a country which has strategic and deep-seated historical differences with China. But Marcus, sorry, if I can, sorry, I need to check. If I can push you to that question, right. that okay, would be yeah, fantastic. Cool. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, just quickly, I think that there's there's this there's this there's this diplomatic failure, uh, and uh, very quickly, and and on issues, China is appalling at soft diplomacy, very bad at traditional diplomacy, uh, and I'm regarded as a as an advocate for China, and I'm a, I am an advocate for China as a state and the Chinese people. Here's the problem: I agree overwhelmingly with everything you said, overwhelmingly. Now, if two people who can be seen publicly on, on polar opposites to an argument can sit down. And what I can certainly agree with you, are we ever going to see that dialogue emerge? Because at a governmental level uh, and at a media level, it's just conflict after conflict uh, from both sides. So where does that sensible dialogue eventually emerge? Well, I think right now you have a problem that in, uh, uh, you know, in a lot, with the virus going on and a lot of countries entirely concerned about dealing with it, most political leaders around the world are thinking about trying to shore up their position at home, Xi Jinping very, very much included in that. Uh, and so uh, diplomacy right now in general is not targeted at other countries, but it is targeted at domestic audiences, and that's just a, a fact of life. Um, I do think that... Um, uh, Beginning in about 2008, China decided, 2000 with that financial crisis, China decided that it was tired of the peaceful rise Deng Xiaoping approach and was ready to take on a more confrontational uh, approach with the rest of the world. I think that was a mistake uh, and that uh, the results for China have been terrible and continue to be. Um, and it's, it's, but this is frustrating for Chinese public opinion because they're constantly being told by the government, and to some degree they, it's true, China's getting richer, we're going to be more respected. Well, then how come Taiwan isn't returning? Uh, how come Japan is, is actually still in its alliance with the United States? And how come a hawk like Abe is there why is Australia not treating us with more respect? 
In other words, the image that, China, that the Chinese leadership is projecting to the Chinese people is not being, uh, is, is not reflected by the way people outside China and outside the control of the government are responding. And that creates a big problem for the Chinese government. Now, can the, you know, can or will the government say, well, we need to maybe soften our approach to the rest of the world, um, you know, and, and see if we can't find a way to, to reintegrate a bit better? Or do they feel that the, the sort of domestic loss of face in doing that would be so great that they can't afford the, the change? Now, to some degree, I think that's just a question the rest of us have to wait for Xi Jinping and the people around him to, to think through. And they probably can't do it right now with, uh, you know, in the middle of the, of the economic fallout and the continuing worries of the virus. But it is a, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult and, the, and leaders in, their, in other countries have to respond. I mean, you think about the way China sort of steps into the middle of the European Union's sorest point to try to sort of contribute to Italy's alienation from Germany uh, at a moment of terrible EU crisis. Now, China has no ability really to help Italy. It's not going to pay Italy's debt. It's not going to really, you know, it can't replace Germany and Northern Europe as the economic mainstay of Spain and Portugal. You know, it, it has nothing, what I'm saying is it has no constructive agenda there, but it felt the need to meddle. And the result of that in terms of blowback from Europe is astonishing. So it's... Um, uh, there really needs to be, I think, uh, you know, in a sense, China needs to adjust to, to it's, it's looked at in different ways now. I, I love China. I love the Chinese people. I love Chinese culture. I Chinese food, uh, Chinese art. I've had terrific Chinese students, wonderful exchanges with Chinese scholars. But it does seem that after a period of time in which China was becoming more open to the world and more engaged and more approachable, uh, political decisions inside China took a different course. And I think that needs to change. Thank you, Walter. I'll now hand over to Senior Policy Analyst at AJAC, Aaron Shapiro. Hello, Walter. Uh, th thanks for taking my question. It's about Iran. As you know, Iran and U.S. tensions remain in the headlines with Trump threatening to sink Iranian Navy ships and the recent Iranian satellite launch. What's Trump's uh, overall strategy on Iran, especially in these days of the pandemic? Has it been affected and uh, is it changing? And, but generally, do you think it, the strategy will work? Also, what, what can Australia and other countries be doing right now? Well, I think the, the strategy uh, is to uh, continue putting pressure on Iran uh, in the, you know, and that, uh, you know, so that the, the regime has a harder and harder time in uh, pursuing its ambitious regional foreign policy while providing for the economic needs of the Iranian people. Uh, and it, it comes down to the, the, the sense of uh, people in the Trump administration that the problem with the JCPOA was less that there was a deal with Iran, but that the, the terms of the JCPOA were, were not strong enough, and in particular, um, left Iran's regional behavior essentially off the table. And for not only for the United States, but for many countries in the region, and not just Israel, but many Arab countries, Iran's um, uh, policies and regional expansion was, was actually a, a bigger issue than the nuclear issue. Uh, so what I think we can see at bottom is the Trump administration trying to create incentives and create a framework where either this Iranian government or successor government 
would be willing to enter a, you know, an actual comprehensive approach where they stop trying to rule Iraq, stop trying to rule Syria, stop trying to hold Lebanon, expand in Yemen, et cetera, et cetera, but some kind of regional detente connected also to a nuclear uh, weapons settlement. Now that, you know, it's clear that the Iranians don't want to do that. Uh, but it's also clear that the economics of the situ of their situation are getting worse and worse. I think at the moment, uh, the Iranian strategy is to wait in November in hopes that Trump will not be reelected. Uh, if Trump, you know, if Biden is elected, it'll be interesting to see what he does. He's already said he, he doesn't think you can just go back to the JCPOA. To some degree, it's dead. Um, so what, you know, but... If Trump is reelected, then I think we we get into a kind of an end game here, where the Iranians now look at an indefinite continuation of this kind of policy. The combat, the coronavirus has severely weakened Iran, both because of the effects of the virus in Iran and the effects of the virus on the gold on the oil price, uh, further reducing the the very small amount of money they're able to make. And it's also interesting that when Russia launched its um, uh, price war against Saudi Arabia, it was throwing Iran under the bus, as we say in the U.S. That is, it was, um, you know, it was Iran would be a, an enormous victim of the oil price crash that Russia unleashed when it decided to open the oil, the, the price war against Saudi Arabia, and Russia didn't care. That is a very, China, by the way, has also been steadily reducing its economic relationship with Iran. So where all this is headed, it's impossible to say. But I think if you were to talk to people in the State Department, in the White House, and so on, they would say that, that, that while the end is not in sight, the strategy is accomplishing much of what they hoped it would accomplish, and they don't see much reason to change what they're doing. That I know. They really, you know, you don't hear a lot of talk from people in the Trump administration about let's change our Iran strategy. They seem reasonably happy with where it is. Thank you, Walter. I do see that there are, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I will get to them at the end. I do want to keep us going and I will click now to Judy versus Dinah. Thank you. Am I off? Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for a really illuminating um, presentation, Walter. My question is sort of simple. Um, Scott Morrison has been blustering, I would call it, about an international global investigation into China and China's been blustering back and it seems to be a bit of bluster both ways. But my question is, are there other people joined in that international, and that's in inverted commas, investigation or is it pure bluster? You know what, I have to tell you, I don't really know because I haven't, you know, um, here in the United States, the, the WHO conversation is all about, wait a minute, what is Donald Trump doing getting out of the WHO? So we have not really focused on this investigation, at least I haven't. Um, you know, the reality is that there, there can't be a good investigation if China resists it. So, but then on the other hand, if the fact that China is going to veto, a, a, you know, forbid a, an effective investigation does that mean that no one else should say they want one it's a it's a tricky situation and it sort of depends on what your goals are uh, but um and i you would have to ask the prime minister what he what he what he's trying to accomplish there i can't tell you thank you walter now i'll hand over to policy analyst in the sydney ajac office judy maynard Hi, th <clears throat> thanks, Walter. Um, earlier this year, the Trump administration released its Middle East peace plan, uh, but with a pandemic that's largely disappeared from view. Um, firstly, do you think the plan can work? And secondly, uh, the new government in Israel is talking about annexing parts of the West Bank as part of that plan. Um, 
If that goes ahead, what do you think the likely international implications are for Israel? Okay, well, I, um, I don't think that this peace plan is the magic rabbit that's been pulled out of the hat that is going to, you know, settle the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that, uh, you know, people like Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt weren't able to settle it. And I guess Jared Kushner may not settle it either. Uh, but uh, it, in terms of the annexation, um, again, it totally depends on what kind of annexation we're talking about. I get the sense that um, the Prime Minister of Israel's office has been looking at what you might call a minimal annexation. That is one that's largely confined to the settlement blocks, the large settlement blocks that basically everyone, including the Palestinians, has understood for some time would be part of Israel you know, in any final settlement. Um, if that's the kind of annexation we're looking at, it is, you know, people will write memoranda, diplomats will write notes, and perhaps the EU would try, you know, would, would say, well, that doesn't exempt these things from uh, our customs issues with settlement produced goods, and we don't recognize the annexation. But it, you know, it's not, it's not a, a violation of the status quo, you know, on the ground. Uh, so it, it very much, you know, on the other hand, a more sweeping annexation where say all the settlements in the, in the territories were declared to be now and forever part of Israel, plus the Jordan Valley, plus, 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 and you have a completely new map emerging, that's a bigger diplomatic issue. Um, it remains the case that um, that the Arabs are much more interested in Israel's va value as an ally against Iran now and possibly Turkey later than, th than they are concerned about um, the Palestinians. But that doesn't mean that they're entirely indifferent to the Palestinians. And it certainly doesn't mean that they can accept certain kinds of affronts. So excuse me, I think what we'll, what we'll see is that the Israeli government, as, as all Israeli governments have, have to do, has to calculate the balance between, you know, what is, um, you know, is, is it, you know, how much does Israel want to risk the wrath of the international community versus how much does it want to accomplish something in terms of redrawing the map? Very hard to say, uh, but I think it's the larger the annexation, the more ambitious the annexation, the more difficult it is in Israeli politics and the more difficult it is internationally. Okay, Walter, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you quick fire questions to two that we've got in the chat. So if, so if you can give us uh, the They'd be questions, but if you can give some succinct answers, and then I'll hand over to Sharon, Sharon Middleman, who will ask the final question. So the two questions that we have from the chat, uh, the first is to date, can the BRI be seen as a success or failure? And at the same time, if you can quickly handle whether or not you believe the UK will still allow Huawei uh, in its 5G network. All right, um, BRI as success, yes and no. Parts of it are a success, uh, but also you have to ask yourself why. What's the point of the BRI? And to some degree, it's you know it's it's actually just a way to package a lot of projects that give big contracts to powerful Chinese companies. That there's no longer any place in China where you can go and pour cement and have somebody pay for it. But if you can have a road across Pakistan or all kinds of other things, you've got great contracts for well-connected companies and the state calls it part of foreign policy. So there's, there's a, there's a kind of a, uh, you know, it's political. And so, you know, it may never have been intended, I mean, pack it, it was packaged as something that would, that might have an economic and a payoff, but maybe, maybe not. Um, so, 
you could say it's it may not change the world yet as much as some hoped and others feared, but it may bring smiles of quiet satisfaction to the people who are able to count the amount of money that they've made uh, through the contracts associated with the BRI. Um, you know, what will happen with the UK and Huawei? I think that's up to Boris Johnson. Uh, anybody who can read Boris Johnson's mind is, uh, is, is, is a better telepath than I am. Uh, I do think that, that clearly the climate in the UK has turned against China for some of the same factors we've been talking about uh, in other countries. And you, you've seen, if anything, growing sentiment in the Tory party against both the Huawei decision and in general a policy of coming close to China. But, um, you know, a lot of people like Tom Tugendhat are taking the lead on that are people that are not in the government because Bojo didn't want them in the government. So we'll have to see. He's very happy now. He has a new son, I guess. Uh, he'll probably spend a few days re both recovering from coronavirus and enjoying the pleasures of a, of a new baby. But uh, he, it'll be interesting to see what he, what he suggests. And, I honestly can't predict it. Fair enough. One final question, uh, Sharon Middleman. Hi, Walter. Thank you so much for your presentation. I just wanted to ask about the resurgence of anti-Semitism in light of the coronavirus, where there's been a number of um, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. How do you think we? Why do you think Jewish people are blamed at times of crisis, and what do you think we can do to counter that? Well. It's no surprise, is it, that um, uh, something happens and, and people in different places start saying, you know, it's the Jews. It's worth remembering that um, there's a long association between plagues and epidemics and outbreaks of anti-Semitism. And, and some of the worst outbreaks in European history uh, occurred around the time of the Black Death, where Jews were blamed by some for for poisoning wells, for spreading the infection, whatever. So this is sad to say it's nothing new, and also sad to say this won't be the last pandemic or the last uh, disaster where various uh, people are going to find a way to blame the Jews for, for it. What can you do about it? Well, I think one thing is you should have a, a strong national state for the Jewish people that uh, can defend itself and can act effectively as an advocate for Jews around the world. Um, uh, you know, one of the big differences between now and past centuries is not that anti Semitism has gone away, but that there is a Jewish state and that this Jewish state. Uh, it, you know, can make its weight felt in world affairs and can really take a courageous lead. And of course, Jews also know that in worst case, there's a place they can go. So uh, there's that. There's obviously the continuing efforts of education, of reaching each new generation with a message of tolerance and understanding, uh, trying to help people see Jews not as some sort of strange abstraction, but as your neighbors, your friends, your, your teacher, your grocer, um, that's, that's, I think, part of it. Uh, it is interesting that many of the people who, who are the most committed anti-Semites these days have actually very little connection with or knowledge of Jews. But Jews are not the cause of anti-Semitism. I think this is something that we need to remember especially now when anti-Semitism seems to be surging or in, in many places around the world. Uh, the causes of this lie outside the Jewish community. To some degree, the, the solutions lie outside the Jewish community. 